I'm honored to, to be in that position. Uh, a lot has happened in this last year. Uh, however, today is a day of uh, not looking behind us, but looking forward to uh, improving safety in our industry. Uh, NIMSA has an important mission as a collaboration of waterfront leaders and safety personnel from throughout North America. We gather with the goal of protecting the health and safety of all those in the marine cargo handling industry. Since 1972, we have created educational materials, advocated for operational safety improvements, and worked together on solutions to safety issues in our industry. Next year will be our 50th anniversary, which we're real proud of, and we hope you'll be there to join us in person, hopefully, in, uh, in Miami at the Biltmore Hotel. Uh, we have some great speakers for today uh, and our two-day event. We hope the information you receive during your time with us will help you in your efforts to create a safe and healthy working environment at your workplace. Uh, the sessions today and tomorrow will be recorded and made available to NIMSA members on the NIMSA, NIMSA member site. Uh, however, NIMSA will not release any portion of these recordings on social media. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, questions are welcome by all speakers. Uh, please do so through the chat box and we will monitor those and take your questions as we go along. Um, make sure to turn on your video and introduce yourself before speaking so that we, uh, we, we know who's talking to us. And with so many people on the call, our computers will run much better if we turn off our video um, while not speaking. So thank you for your help on that, on the bandwidth. Um, and please remember that everyone will be muted by the host, and uh, I think she's going to mute me pretty soon. So uh, moving on, I want to hand over uh, or I want to pass on to Mark Baker, who is uh, ex president of NIMSA and also a board member uh, for 30 years, and uh, he's going to introduce uh, our first sponsor. So moving on to you, Mark. Thank you, President. Um, I have the the honor of uh, introducing Tim Orr from uh, Terminal Investment Corporation. Tim joined in April of 1988, and I believe that's when we first met in Savannah. Uh, as a leader, he values relationships with the key element of service and lives the core values of Tyco, committing to long-term relationships with customers, holding each business relationship with integrity, and insisting on quality in all the aspects of their business. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to call him a friend. And uh, with further ado, Tim, take it away. Mark, I really appreciate those kind words. And yeah, it's been a long time. Uh, 1988 goes way back to the Universal Maritime days uh, with Tony Petrizzo and the, the whole gang. And uh, we're just happy to be a sponsor here. And big believers in safety. And I think I've said it on more than one occasion to most people that know me, but safety is a culture here at Tyco. It's not just a belief. And we think it, uh, it it's seen throughout our product line, uh, our services and everything. There's a small slide presentation we're putting up now, which is a PowerPoint. Kind of goes through what Tyco is and what we're about. Uh, Tyco was built on a belief of uh, the marine environment is a specialized environment that requires kind of out of the ordinary equipment and Tyco took on a quest some 45 years ago to make a piece of equipment that was first and foremost safe, easy to operate, lowest life cycle cost, a regenerative, I'd say, uh, truck that can be rebuilt over and over again. But once again, safety uh, was one of the biggest drivers in what we did. Um, not only safety to the driver and the people around it, but also to our mechanics and other people's mechanics that work on this equipment. So the real world design that we got from being the only manufacturers of this style of equipment in the country that also run a fleet, we run about 1700 tractors in the rental fleets. We get firsthand knowledge, not only from our folks, but from your folks that operate the truck every day as to what it takes to make it, uh, how to get around port rash that we see everywhere we operate, and how to make the truck safer to get on and get off. Um, most of the big changes in the truck come directly from drivers and mechanics, although we have a great staff of engineers. Uh, real world R&D is what we're all about. 
So you can go to the next slide. This gives a little bit about the Tyco terminal services side of our business for other than being the second largest manufacturer of terminal tractors in the country. We also, like I said, operate a huge fleet. Um, that fleet is powered by the hour. It's very unique to the maritime industry. Um, our, our great customers get to use this, pay for it when they need it. They don't have to pay for it when they don't need it. So it's just like the light bill. If you want to see, you turn on the light. If you don't, you turn it off and you only pay for when you use it. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, the next slide is in 2006, for the first really 35 years of the company, we uh, strictly built for our own fleets. Uh, 2006, we made an expansion into the retail markets, which was a great big, huge learning curve for Tyco. And it meant that we had to go out and see folks that operate in different environments, in different ports, in different scenarios, and try to meld all that into a, a truck that's not only the safest in the industry, but also the most robust. Uh, that R&D that comes from our port relationships is huge and one of the biggest driving factors in what the truck is today. Uh, next slide, please. Once again, we look at everything and I think Mark introduced me as a, a relationship type person. That's really what we are because the only thing we have to sell is really who we are, the reputation of our products and the reputation, most importantly, of our service. And we are first and foremost a service driven company that's driven on safety. We partner with all of our customers. We actually call them our partners, not necessarily our customers. I think Mark can attest to that over the years. I know our folks at SSA Series, Ports America, and the myriad of other waterfront operators that we supply equipment to, I think feel the same way as we do to them. We're here to serve them. We're here to help them. They're here to help us too, not only with the safety aspects of it, but also in maintainability, long life, and lowest possible operating cost over the life of the equipment. Next slide, please. One of the things that we have built since 2006, which is outside of the core business of rental and leasing, is the for sale markets. And we've pretty much covered North America, as you'll see in the map here. We have 30 full service dealers throughout uh, the, the 48 contiguous states, plus Canada and Mexico, with about 140 individual locations. So outside of the corporate side of what we provide in maintenance and equipment to port related partners, we also have the likes of UPS, FedEx, and a myriad of other, uh, what I'll call interior United States operators that purchase and use Tyco tractors on a daily business. Uh, this has probably been the biggest growth side of what we've done outside of the South Atlantic and Gulf where we really supply these power by the hour systems. Next slide, please. Tyco Edge is one of the newest things that we've done and it allows our customers, dealers, uh, as well as the in inside part of the company to really go over and go beyond what most companies do as far as warranty tracking, failure tracking, and maintenance. Next page, please. We're the only ones in this industry, in the terminal tractor side and most of the mostly even the forklift side, that have this type of uptime center. And there's a small snapshot you'll see on the screen of our uptime center. And anytime one of our customers has an issue, and this is on the for sale side as well as with our, within our own fleets, we can track log in an absolute transparent manner, everything that's going on with that tractor. Uh, it gives our customers on the for sale side, the ability to assign equipment to a dealer to get repaired or to come directly to us with issues. And it allows them on a basic heads up type display uh, to look and see on a, we'll call it a dashboard, exactly where that equipment is, where it is in the process, have the parts been shipped, and is the, we'll call it the repair order closed and back up. It allows not only fleets, but individual users to really see exactly how the process works so that we never have issues where trucks sit down for multiple days waiting on parts or because somebody just simply dropped the ball. Uh, Tyco Edge is something new we've been doing for the last two years. It's really taken off on the retail markets. 
And it's something that we're starting to use internally to not only drive the service and uptime, but also customer uh, satisfaction on the service side. Can we go to the next slide? So the Tyco way is basically what we're all about is, I should have put safety as the number one, but that's almost goes without saying, but maximum uptime with a piece of equipment that's very easy to repair with standard hair, hand tools, not a lot of proprietary equipment on it, fast and simple maintenance, everything is open. We also engineered out most of the damage parts that you see happen in ports like headlight panels and other things that have to be constantly replaced. We look at driver performance and driver safety is two of the biggest items as far as anything goes with the truck. We were the first people to put a three point seat belt harness into a terminal tractor and the first to use high visibility webbing on that seat belt to make it instantly identifiable whether the driver had a seat belt on or not. Um, driver performance comes down to ergonomics and his comfort. That's been a big driver since we went into the retail markets in 2006 and it's something we'll probably never end. It continues to go on to make that place a safer, easier, nicer place for the guy to work all day. And the last part is value. And we look at value as a full life cycle cost because you can always find a cheaper piece of equipment. But in our own culture here, we look at it saying you only purchase the truck once, but you maintain it for the life of the truck. So maintenance becomes the biggest issue on not only low downtime, easy to maintain, but also high residual values if you do decide to get rid of the piece of equipment. Next slide. Some of the standard safety features, and we'll go through this quickly. Uh, next slide, please. You'll see that Tyco is very big on the three point connection to the tractor, also making all the walk surfaces the same design, same color, so that instant differentiation comes from the driver when he steps out the back door onto the tractor to be able to see the areas where we need him to walk and stay away from. You'll also notice the deep stair tread in the tank itself, something Tyco holds the patent on. We want to make it as ergonomic and easy to get on and off the truck. This is used to be one of the number one slip and fall accidents, and it was actually Universal Maritime in Charleston that challenged us to build a tank that was easy to get on and off. And with that, we came up with the tank you're seeing now, which is a 65 gallon tank, largest in the industry, would go all the way up to 80 gallons but it also affords a guy or gal the ability to get on and off the truck with a full placement of their foot instead of just a toe or heel. Next, next slide, please. This again gives you a good shot of that. We can go to the next slide. The cab protection bar is something that's near and dear to us as we have a composite, no rust, uh, shall we say, uh, dent proof cab, putting the cab protection bar was something that we just saw as a no brainer. And a lot of people in the port industry do that, but outside of the port, you rarely see it. All of our trucks have it. It's a standard option. I mean, a standard, excuse me, feature of the truck itself, as are things such as the breakaway glad hands that were developed by Tyco, uh, air operated rear doors for ease of driver ingress and egress as well as safety to get a guy in and out of the truck. He can't slam his hand on the sliding door. In an emergency, you can easily overcome the air pressure that holds the doors closed to extradate the, the driver in the, bat, in, the, in the event of a very bad accident. Next page, please. Once again, looking at the tow guard, seeing that we operate these trucks on a daily basis, unlike most manufacturers, we look at it to how do we make it safe for not only our own customers, but everybody else that buys the truck. So things such as distance between edges, um, tow guard catches so people's feet don't slip, on, slip under the steps. And once again, visual areas that allow the driver to see exactly where he can and can't stand. Next slide. The breakaway glad hands we talked about earlier are basically a double set of glad hands on the tractor protection bar should a driver pull away from a uh, trailer without uncoupling from the airlines. This simply allows the airline to detach. The driver can go back, reattach it, go back to work rather than having to go back to a shop for a popped airline or a broken ferrule. Next one, please. 
That also eliminates any snap back into the driver's uh, cabin from a, a line that's not unhooked. Some of the optional things we offer, next, next slide please, are things such as a driver's training seat. And we even offer this in an air seat. We're the only manufacturer that can put two air seats into a single tractor that allows the driver to get in and out of the truck with the trainer in the seated position. This is a huge, I mean, a huge plus for everybody in the industry, especially where we do OJT. Our guys can go out there or, or the ILA can be trained with a competent trainer in the seat beside him in a nice air seat configuration or in the style you see in this picture here where it's a fold away seat where training is done less, shall we say, often in the non-port related areas. Uh, and the far right picture is some of our competitors. We will see they have a doghouse that comes into the cab itself, which eliminates the ability of putting a driver sitting forward with a full sit seat belt on and still have the driver get in and out. So this is a big safety driven thing that Tyco developed about 10 years ago, really to push safety on the port and allow newbie drivers to get trained by competent, well-versed drivers in real world under the hook and around the terminal. Next page, please. Um, we do offer options which are used both in ports and out of ports for front and rear facing cameras with a left hand dash display, which is just an added area of safety in row row or operations where there's a lot of ground people. Next slide, please. 2021 R&D roadmap. Um, these are the things that Tyco is working on right now as far as not just the electric future and autonomous trucks, which we're working on, but also the new tiered engines from Cummins and others, mandated by EPA, of course. Electronic stability control, which will become part of the truck. Multiplex elect electrical systems, which make everything much simpler from a maintenance standpoint, and which gives us higher uptime and less blown bulbs. Uh, and telepark and electric vehicles. Next page, please. <laughs> Now, what Tyco really five years ago, when everybody started looking at electrics and EVs, um, was something we did not want to be the first into. Um, it's kind of like automobiles. Ford didn't build the first automobile, but he built probably the best automobile of his time when he started because he took, I guess, the stepping stones and the bridges from everybody else building cars and figured out how do I build a better car, faster, better, cheaper, that's safer. Tyco's doing the same thing, and rather than jump directly into, into electrics that were provided by boutique companies that were single sourced, Tyco chose to take what we call the bridge to electric. And in doing so, uh, we're really the nation's only providers of natural gas powered trucks, gasoline powered trucks, soon to be LPG again, uh, as well as the clean diesel. Uh, so what we look at it, Instead of jumping directly into electrics, we wanted to give our customer and customer base the ability to transition into electrics and zero uh, emission vehicles through a system of cleaner and cleaner internal combustion. Um, we're happy to say now that we have picked our partners, and I'm sure a lot of you saw the press releases between uh, Tyco and Volvo, including Volvo Penta and Cummins Engine Company. Um, we chose to go with two global leaders in not only engines themselves, but also in electric systems. Volvo, of course, produces the VN electric right now, which you can buy for over the road. Uh, we will be riding their coattails, as they say, on technology, batteries, and everything else, as well as it gives us the ability to service and supply our customers with the necessary parts, infrastructure, and information and training to keep those trucks running, which has been one of the biggest issues on all the EV fronts, is getting everybody trained and having a supply chain issue where you can get part service and uptime to your end user. Next, next slide, please. Now you'll see our EV. One more slide, please. And you'll see why we chose those two, which we went through a little bit earlier. But one of the biggest issues that we looked at early on with everybody that's in the electric game right now was the boutique side of supplies. Um, 
And that's not casting asparagus, as they say, on any of our competitors because they're all great guys and great people. Um, but we think we're going to do it a little bit smarter by having multinational companies back us with their technologies so that we can provide these trucks anywhere in the world, fully serviced, fully backed with parts, service, and training to anybody. Next, next please. It says when test vehicles, and let me go through that just a little bit. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have within our own internal fleets, and we think our customers within NEMSA have too, is just the cost of infrastructure and the cost of the equipment alone. Uh, we're not the first to get in the game, and we're not going to be the last to get in the game. We're going to get in right at the right time. We will start running tests really fourth quarter of 21, the first tests on the betas will be out, and test vehicles for our customers will be out quarter one of 2022. The reason for this lag, of course, is development time to use existing components into our trucks that allow us proven technology and proven components on real world applications and not boutiques. But one of the biggest issues we see going forward with the electrics is the infrastructure to support such. And that's the reason we really invested in the bridge to electric, as we call it. Um, when you look at the costs of a terminal that says has 150 trucks working at it um, and having to have every driver return to a proprietary uh, charging center at every available opportunity becomes a real not only infrastructure cost when you think about tearing up your terminal to run all that electricity, but also the costs associated with plugging, unplugging, and making sure everybody's charged and ready to go. And that's going to take a while, and it's going to take a huge amount of money and in infrastructure, never mind three times the cost of the truck. Although that will come down over time, infrastructure will continue to go up. So most of our customers that we look at are looking for something that gets them between where we are right now in 2021 and where they want to be by 2030. Uh, so that stepping stone allows... Tyco's customers to take advantage of renewable RNG, uh, things such as propane, and it, believe it or not, gasoline is big with UPS. So we've provided those platforms to allow time for the infrastructure to grow to really get to pure electrics, and not only that, for the batteries. Because right now, when you look at real estate on a terminal tractor with 116 to 127 inch wheelbase, you really don't have much space for tractors. And just as a way of quantifying that, and I'll be quiet here in a minute, your typical warehouse operation uses about 106 kW of power per day, and your average port, and what we've done our tests, is about 560 kW a day. So when you look at the energy um, that's, that's used up by the terminal tractor in the typical port operation is close to more than five times that of what you see in a typical warehouse operation. And these are the things that we look at, not only as the operator of this equipment, but also as the manufacturer of this equipment. And how do we get battery technology to that level to run in these larger ports, multiple shifts, so that shifts, so that ships aren't waiting on trucks, which is the worst thing that happens, and that the infrastructure can support it in quick charging. And we feel that's still a few years off as far as battery technology. But once again, we want to be able to have a stepping stone that allows our customers to have first class equipment right up until the point it all goes EV. Uh, last slide was just a little bit of our culture here at Tyco and some of our visions. And like I said before, safety is really a culture here. It's not a belief. It's ingrained in us. We look at it in everything we do because anything that has moving parts is a dangerous scenario, and everybody needs to live that, breathe it, and know it on every aspect. Priorities, integrity, and quality, of course, follow that. So I really appreciate the time to present this. I hope I didn't take too much time. And like I said, we're proud to be a sponsor of NIMSA and available for any questions anybody has. Tim, this is Lauren Brand. <clears throat> I have a huge favor to ask you. Sure. Um, Rear, Rear Admiral Mauger has a real hard stop at um, 10 minutes before the hour. And I was wondering, we do have two questions. Is it possible for you to stay 
uh, listen with us to Rear Admiral Mauger, and then we'll go to your questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Rob, thank back you. to you. Th th yeah, thank you, Tim, and th thank you for your sponsorship and your and your friendship to NIMSA these uh, all these years. Um, I'd like to uh, move on to our to our uh, speaker for today, our first speaker for today. Um, my privilege to introduce uh, U.S. Coast Guard Rear Admiral, Admiral John W. Mauger. He's the Assistant Command for Prevention with Coast Guard. Admiral Mauger took on the role just this past month, and uh, we're looking forward to working with him in his new position. Uh, you can see his bio. It's up on the screen now. And um, uh, he's an experienced leader who implemented safety regulations while serving as the commanding officer of the Coast Guard Marine Safety Center. We're fortunate to have him here today, and uh, let's let's uh, get started with uh, Admiral Mauger. Welcome. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, just want to do a quick audio check. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Pretty pretty good. Maybe a little little more volume. All right. Let me see if we can right. uh, get this uh, going. Uh, give me one sec. Sir, you seem to be on mute now. My apologies. I'm just going to have to uh, project. That's uh, fine. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Good. Well, hey, thanks so much for, uh, for the time this afternoon. And uh, I don't have slides to uh, present. So uh, what I'd like to do is just walk through a couple of remarks and then really look forward to uh, the discussion with all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, today uh, with uh, uh, President Tita and, and the whole membership here uh, from the National Maritime Safety uh, Association. It, as you hear from my remarks, it's not lost on uh, me, the Coast Guard, uh, the men and women that uh, you work with out in the ports every day, uh, the importance of the work uh, that you do, uh, both in our local communities uh, and for our nation. And so I'm going to take a few minutes today to uh, talk you through um, you know, what, what we see is, is uh, ha happening here in the MTS, how we're positioned for it, how we're working across the interagency and uh, working nationally to get after it, and then uh, open it up for uh, discussion uh, with all of you. Because uh, even from the last uh, presenter there uh, with Tycho and, and Tim's great presentation, uh, there's a lot to learn uh, here. And, and we're in the midst of a tremendous change as we drive to get more capacity out of the maritime transportation system while meeting uh, increased expectations for sustainability, as you saw. And the end result of that is, uh, folks, our lives are just going to get much more complex than they are today. And so forums like this to bring everybody together to have those, uh, share those different views and perspectives, uh, learn from one another, really super important. And uh, so thanks so much for uh, let me be a part of it. Um, I also just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Lauren. Uh, thanks so much for uh, your service to the nation and, and for what you're doing with uh, NIMSA. It's great to be here with you today again, Lauren. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, as, as we get through this, uh, you know, I hope that you come away uh, from my comments with uh, a sense of gratitude for uh, the work that uh, you, you uh, your members, uh, your employees uh, do every day uh, out there in the ports. Um, it has been a, uh, to say it's been a challenging year is a, truly an understatement. Uh, and you've demonstrated a tremendous amount of resilience and leadership in addressing uh, the challenges associated with COVID. But it, but it hasn't been just COVID, as you all know. Uh, COVID's been a big part. It's impacted your operations. It's affected you personally uh, and your families personally, your workers personally. Um, but, you know, for those of you down in the uh, South Atlantic and along the Gulf Coast, we've also seen the big, busiest hurricane season on record uh, last year uh, with uh, just a huge number of storms uh, impacting our coast. Uh, we saw uh, the winter freeze uh, that came through and impacted uh, refineries and, and ports, uh, you know, down along the Texas coast. Uh, and we've had just a number of disruptions to our supply chain, uh, both from uh, man-made disasters uh, and, uh, again, natural disasters. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, those impacts. 
Um, but despite all of that, uh, you know, I think we're because of all of that, uh, there's what I would offer from here in Washington, D.C., is that there's an increasing recognition of the importance of the maritime transportation system uh, to our national economy and to our national defense. I think you all know this uh, extremely well, but, uh, you know, we talk frequently about uh, the, M the maritime transportation system's role in generating uh, over 25 percent or a quarter of U.S. GDP. Uh, we talk about its role in um, our ability to project power internationally uh, for defense. And, and both of those, both our economic prosperity and defense underpin our national security. And so uh, thank you so much uh, for what you do. Um, as, as I uh, focus in on a couple areas, uh, let, me, let me talk uh, a little bit more about the MTS, uh, the Maritime Transportation System, and then um, I'll talk a little bit uh, as well about um, how we're positioning uh, ourselves uh, and then uh, some of the, and broaden it out a little bit to uh, broader issues about um, the shared use of the waterway and the increase in complexity that we're all going to see. Uh, presents a lot of opportunity, but uh, we're going to have to uh, create some new partnerships, new stakeholders. Uh, and so today's a great start uh, to uh, some of that conversation. So uh, it, as, as I mentioned uh, with regard to the maritime transportation system, I think the events of the last six months have really highlighted, at least here uh, in, in D.C. and nationally, um, the importance of the maritime transportation system. We're seeing it in uh, uh, media, we're seeing it in uh, the national dialogue. Um, you know, when we when we take a look at things like uh, the uh, grounding of the Ever Given in the Suez uh, Canal, and uh, BBC reports that that uh, is causing uh, disruptions of 6.7 million dollars per minute uh, for every minute uh, that ship was grounded. The uh, supply chain impacts uh, extend over a period of months. Um, people start to ask, hey, uh, you know, what what is this resource uh, of global shipping? What is this resource of global trade and, and how are we positioned for it? But it's not just the global uh, shipping. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, we had to shut down uh, the waterway on the Inland River system as uh, I-40 uh, going over uh, near Memphis had developed some serious cracks in the bridge. And uh, we had about uh, three days worth of traffic. Uh, stacked up there on the river with uh, 45 towboats and 700 barges uh, just stuck waiting uh, to get through. Um, we had a local trucking association there estimate that that was costing about $2.4 million a day um, because of the time that it was taking to uh, reroute that traffic and move them around. And so a very difficult uh, call for us uh, to uh, close the waterway because of the uh, bridge uh, damage, but also really important to uh, look out for the safety and look out for uh, the long-term effects and, and make sure that uh, we're doing things uh, right. I talked a little bit about the disruptions that uh, hurricanes have caused. Uh, we had uh, Hurricane Laura that uh, went through um, the Gulf Coast there and uh, uh, ended up uh, sinking a lot of barges in the Sabine uh, Natchez Pass which is a critical uh, pass for uh, military outload operations. So it was a whole of uh, community, whole of government effort to uh, get that area cleared and make sure that we were meeting the needs for defense. And then uh, you folks as well know that it's not just uh, these um, physical disasters or, or the ship grounding. It's also uh, our increasing reliance on information and information systems and the impact that uh, cyber disruptions and cyber attacks can have on us. Um, I, you know, well publicized uh, number of events uh, already this year. Uh, starting with uh, K-Line shipping uh, and, and the impacts that that had on uh, the fleet and uh, the vessels uh, that were calling uh, in the U.S. due to a ransomware attack that happened back on the company. While there were no uh, uh, documented safety impacts uh, to the vessels, uh, clearly this is an area where um, we all have to be uh, proactive uh, in thinking about uh, the potential impacts and making sure that we're taking uh, precautionary uh, steps to ensure uh, the safety of the port and the continuity of operations. Uh, again, domestically, uh, you know, we all uh, saw and here in the Northeast felt the impacts 
of uh, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. Um, but I think you all also recognize that Colonial Pipeline is the parent company to Colonial Terminals, which operates about 40-some uh, uh, Coast Guard uh, MTSA-regulated uh, facilities on the waterway. So uh, as we talk about that incident uh, here in Washington, D.C., and work with the interagency and national security leaders, uh, we're really quick to point out that uh, – the intermodal transportation is a system. It's a network system of component parts, as, as you all are well aware. And we need to make sure that, um, you know, we act accordingly across uh, those parts to address the risks and, and while ensuring uh, the, the seamless flow of com commerce that drives our economic prosperity and underpins our national defense. And so, um, you know, as we look at these disruptions and uh, the attention uh, that they've uh, uh, caused, uh, we've been working to uh, educate uh, both uh, government leaders uh, in on the administration side and in Congress and work with our interagency partners to make sure that folks uh, understand uh, those impacts. Uh, in terms of uh, our ability to project power, there's only so much that we can do with DOD airlift. And while it is, uh, you know, a, a world's greatest uh, air force and capable of, of really doing heroic things, uh, we need that uh, sea lift and we need those port communities uh, to really um, uh, support our troops uh, overseas. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, we talked about uh, the economic impacts uh, on that and, and folks here at home have felt that uh, whether it's uh, disruptions in the supply chain, disruptions in food, disruptions in uh, store stocking uh, and, and the shelves and, and the different goods and, uh, that folks are looking for, um, people uh, feel that uh, inherently in the port. And we've been talking about what we're doing uh, in that regard. And so we've been working very hard to uh, make sure that throughout all of this, uh, we continue to conduct our missions as uh, efficiently as possible and educate across uh, the interagency. You know, from uh, the prevention community standpoint, we've taken a number of measures uh, on uh, the Mariner side uh, to uh, expand the intervals uh, for credentialing, uh, to ensure that uh, folks can continue to work and operate. Um, we have continued to get out there and conduct the uh, facility uh, inspections and vessel inspections uh, to make sure that uh, those facilities and vessels can continue to do uh, their work. Uh, and then, of course, uh, every day we're out there as well marking uh, the channels uh, and um, uh, making sure that the uh, boating public is uh, out there uh, enjoying the waterway but doing it uh, safely too. And then, uh, of course, uh, responding to these incidents and investigating them and documenting that, capturing those lessons learned and moving forward. Um, and so uh, when, when accidents uh, do happen, uh, we were really quick to also make sure that uh, we put the right response posture in place. Of course, uh, a lot of uh, the response that happens out there is uh, industry-driven response. And, uh, and so it's done with uh, federal, state, local involvement and oversight. Um, but it's really making sure that we have uh, continued strong partnerships with uh, industry response organizations, as well as the federal, state, and uh, local uh, response organizations, and continue to work through our harbor safety committees and our area maritime security committees and the area committees to ensure that uh, we have uh, the plans and preparation in, in place to uh, get, a, get after that. Uh, so let me talk for a minute about, um, you know, some of the challenges that I see coming up with regard to uh, increased uh, use of the waterway. I laid it out, um, you know, at the start by talking about the fact that, uh, you know, we're facing this triple challenge right now in that uh, there is a desire for increased capacity out of the maritime transportation system coming in the form of either more frequent ship calls or larger ship calls or, uh, you know, larger quantities of goods and services uh, moving through the port or different use of the waterways. Um, at the same time, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, um, 
restrictions on uh, the environmental footprint uh, for uh, maritime, whether it's at the facilities uh, or whether it's on the ships. And these are driven by uh, societal expectations, which are driving economic and business expectations, uh, which are you know, also driving uh, regulatory expectations. And so you have increased capacity, reduced environmental footprint, and the only way that uh, you get there is by becoming increasingly more complex, uh, more automated uh, systems out there. Uh, and, and employing different uses of the waterway. And so uh, as we look at the waterway, we recognize that this is a shared resource uh, for both uh, commercial commerce uh, and recreational commerce. And we wanna make sure that we're balancing the needs of industry while ensuring safety, security, and sustainability uh, and access for uh, recreational uh, use as well. Uh, and so where's that, where are, where are those issues uh, playing out? Those issues are playing out right now on the Atlantic coast uh, with the Atlantic coast uh, wind projects. Um, but we also recognize that this isn't gonna be confined to just the Atlantic coast. Uh, BOEM is working right now um, with uh, the Gulf Coast uh, area to talk about uh, wind uh, installations out on the Gulf and then also on the West Coast as well. We see this reflected in the industry. I think workboat uh, conference this year will focus uh, on uh, the wind uh, economy and the wind opportunities as a central talking point uh, for uh, what, uh, um, you know, how the industry is gonna get after this. And, and of course, there's a, a range of other shops that are doing this. So what does this mean uh, to our uh, terminal operators and cargo handlers? I think it means a lot of new opportunities. Um, first, uh, you know, for segments of the maritime industry, there's the opportunity for new ships uh, to go service uh, these facilities, new jobs. Um, there's new supply chains and new cargo uh, moving through the ports to be able to support uh, these operations uh, offshore. Um, but we need to do so in a way that, uh, you know, is uh, responsible and safe and uh, allows for that continued uh, multiple use of the waterway. And so it's a challenge uh, that we're going to be working through with our interagency partners uh, to make sure that uh, we're able to strike uh, that balance uh, going forward. Um, but uh, for us, it's not just about wind. It's not just about um, um, uh, the recreational use, it's also about space, and that's happening on three coasts uh, here as well, both on the South Florida Atlantic coast, on the Gulf Coast, and out on the West Coast. And so uh, earlier this year, uh, you know, we're forging new partnerships, and our commandant had a chance to uh, speak with Elon Musk about his uh, intent and plans and how uh, those uh, impact the current waterway. Uh, both, I think uh, some of you, uh, if you're from the Atlantic Space Coast side, you would have seen their uh, autonomous barge that goes out there and catches the rockets as they uh, um, fall back to uh, Earth and lands them safely on the barge. Uh, so uh, there's that component to their operations, but they're looking for other operations uh, either occurring in, in the waterway or impacting the waterway, uh, depending on when they're launching. And so uh, this, this just adds to uh, the mix of uh, relationships and partnerships uh, that we have to uh, deal with here. And so uh, in closing, and, and I've uh, extended my time, the staff is uh, giving me an extra 10 minutes here. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a lot of time, but uh, we'll be able to uh, go until the top of the hour with uh, questions. Um, but in closing, uh, let me just say again, uh, thanks for uh, what you all have done uh, to uh, help the nation address uh, the challenges uh, with COVID and with uh, the supply chain disruptions uh, by continuing to uh, move uh, those vital supplies uh, through our nation's ports. Um, we're very appreciative of what you've done and been working very hard to uh, tell your story. As we go forward, um, you know, while we're all looking forward to getting back to uh, normal, I think we also all recognize that uh, this next normal is not going to be anything like the last normal, and the world is going to continue to get increasingly complex. And so we're going to have to uh, continue to work to uh, develop new partnerships, to develop new stakeholders, to understand uh, those challenges. Uh, adapt the current uh, operational models we have to uh, meet the demands of the new environment, 
uh, while continuing to, you know, uphold the safety, security, and sustainability of the maritime environment. And so, uh, thanks again for uh, what you do for our economic prosperity, uh, for our national defense, and, and ultimately for our national security. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk with you, and I know that there's uh, probably a few questions out there, so I'll turn it back over to either President Dita or Lauren uh, to facilitate any questions uh, that uh, you may have. Admiral, thank you so much. I don't see Rob, so I'll take the, the role of facilitator, and thank you for the shout-out. That really meant a lot. Um, for those of you who have asked the questions of Mr. Orr, we will be holding those questions and we will answer them uh, with Mr. Orr as soon as this uh, uh, session is completed with the Rear Admiral. Um, so here's the first question and please put them in the chat box. Sir, how do you see the U.S. Coast Guard involved in regulating and controlling autonomous vessels? Wow, thanks. Uh, you know, that's a really uh, interesting challenge for us and it hits us on a couple of different areas. Um, and so, uh, you know, first, I, I just spent the last year running uh, the Coast Guard's fleet of uh, vessels and capabilities, both our aircraft and our ships. And so one of the things that I wanted to do uh, while I was in charge of that was make sure that we are developing future capabilities that rely on autonomous um, um, uh, craft or autonomous capabilities and unmanned systems, because uh, we as a Coast Guard have a need for that, uh, just like the uh, industry does. And then, so that's part of, uh, you know, us trying to take advantage of that as a, uh, as a customer or consumer. But as, as noted in the question, we're also the maritime regulator. And we looked at that from a number of different issues. Uh, we look at that from uh, both the regulation and the safe use of the waterway. And we've put, uh, we've had a long history of uh, navigation safety standards that are based on the assumption that there are manned vessels uh, moving around uh, our ports uh, and on our waterways. And so we have to look critically across all of those uh, different standards to uh, think about how that changes uh, when there's unmanned. At the same time, on the vessels, um, we've built uh, whole cargo systems and operating systems around the assumption uh, and regulations for those around the assumption that there are manned, trained, uh, certificated uh, uh, mariners uh, on board those vessels. And so we have to dig through uh, those assumptions as well. The good news is we've started that work, uh, working in coordination. This is not going to be a U.S. Uh, issue. And in fact, the first uh, autonomous uh, shipping vessels are already operating uh, you know, large scale cargo vessels are already operating in, in uh, Northern Europe. We're anxiously awaiting the arrival of the Mayflower. If you haven't seen that one, it's an autonomous vessel that's going to sail over from uh, Plymouth to, um, uh, to the U.S. Uh, at some point uh, this summer. Um, but we're working through the International Maritime Organization to identify where all those relationships and risks are, uh, catalog those and start getting after it. Uh, I think it's a uh, exciting opportunity ahead, um, but uh, one that we're going to have to think through uh, very carefully in order to make sure that we strike that right balance. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. That was uh, it's a tough topic and I knew we just threw it at you. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, next question. Are there any particular issues of concern for the Coast Guard in the upcoming federal budget? Oh, thanks so much. I, uh, you know, it, it is a uh, great time uh, to uh, be a federal agency that uh, has multiple uh, missions and is, uh, you know, able to demonstrate our value uh, to the nation across a, a number of different areas. Uh, and so um, the 22 budget uh, has a number of important uh, um, increases uh, for the Coast Guard or capabilities for the Coast Guard. Um, we're going to put more um, in the 21 budget. We were able to uh, create some positions out in the field to um, put um, maritime transportation system cyber experts uh, in uh, the U.S. ports, in, in a select number of U.S. ports. Uh, with the 22 budget, we're going to expand that to uh, all uh, 35 of um, the ports and sectors uh, that uh, we operate. And so I think that those are a really key resource for helping uh, the industry uh, and the Coast Guard understand uh, the changing impact 
impacts of of what uh, um, how, how cyber is changing uh, our business and how cyber attacks impact the business and how we need to address this. And so uh, putting those folks out there in the field is going to be really important. The budget supports that. Budget supports the uh, recapitalization of a uh, number of our ships and capabilities that allow the Coast Guard to get after there, including waterways commerce cutters that are going to, you know, these are 50-plus-year-old uh, cutters that currently uh, serve the inland waterways, and we're going to recapitalize those over the course of the next couple of years. And, and so the budget support that. So I'm I'm really optimistic uh, about the future ahead and, and grateful to the support of the administration and Congress. So thanks so much. That's good. If our support matters, you'll you'll have it, sir. Sure. Um, I have another one. During the pandemic, many Mariner crews were not permitted to change, resulting in crews on ships for extended periods of time. Is there anyone at the Coast Guard looking at this issue for future events? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. I mean, this was something that, uh, you know, we all felt uh, internally and worked very closely across um, the government to uh, make sure that uh, wherever possible um, that uh, the seafarers were uh, treated uh, and the stevedores that are working the docks are treated as, as comparable to aviation workers and, and other key um, professionals in there because of their vital role in um, making sure that uh, we had food, uh, medicine, uh, supplies uh, on our shelves and in our stores. And so uh, we're going to continue to uh, press in on this and make sure that seafarers have access uh, to uh, shore. Uh, this is a multi-jurisdictional problem. It's complex, uh, and uh, you know it relies on uh, again some public-private partnerships as well. Uh, and so we'll appreciate everybody's continued support to uh, make sure that uh, these men and women, uh, you know, can get uh, time ashore, uh, can make the calls, do the business, uh, take care of their own welfare and safety, go to the doctors uh, when they need to, uh, and and make sure that uh, they they do that because um, going to sea is getting tougher for everybody uh, around the world. It's something that we face as a uh, maritime service, um, but it's something that we we understand that the maritime community faces as well, and so we need to look for opportunities opportunities to embrace, thank these folks and, and make it uh, as, as uh, simple as possible, uh, recognizing, uh, you know, all, all the other uh, safety and security challenges that go along with that. Thank you. That's good. It, if you're forming a FACA committee uh, and we could do something to serve on it, or um, if we could serve in any way, let us know. We would like to get some of the members on that. Um, Thanks, Admiral, Mark. are there... Yeah, sure. I, I used to run them, so I know what it takes, but I also know what it takes to have a good participant. So we'll make sure, sure we get good participants. Um, Admiral, are there changes coming in the TWIC program? I just got my TWIC. Don't change it. Uh, and do you see the do you see the requirements fading in the future? Um, well, look, uh, not for me to say whether the requirements are uh, fading in the future. I think uh, I think folks, uh, you know, I, I was looking at the bio that uh, President Dita put up earlier, and it's uh, it's a couple of days old because I've only been in the job for a couple of days yet, and it's uh, still my whole position. And and TWIC is one that I'm uh, coming up to speed on quickly, and so I would ask, uh, you know, that uh, you. Uh, make sure that uh, you're you're ground truthing with our our good folks uh, that are working this. But you know what what I've understood is um, you know a couple of critical steps uh, have been taken with uh, the passage of the law uh, that uh, you know um, put uh, requirements in place for the corrective action plan. That corrective action plan has been signed out. Uh, obviously, and and we're working to get after any policy adjustments to get after um, the risk analysis that was required under that uh, corrective action plan to um, make sure that this program is uh, as effective as possible. Um, on the passenger side, we've uh, implemented some uh, delays uh, to the program, measured delays to the program, uh, to make sure that uh, you know, uh, given where we are uh, in the COVID environment, that folks uh, that need Need to get registered and folks that uh, um, uh, are able to uh, work in that industry can still do so in a timely fashion in order to get uh, uh, those uh, readers in place uh, at the passenger terminals. And so um, I, you know, we're going to continue to uh, execute uh, uh, those plans and uh, look forward to uh, updating you all in the future um, at, a, at a future event. So thanks. Thank you. Rob, do you have questions of the Admiral?
Uh, you're on. Uh, there you go. I do not. I don't have anything further. I know. Uh, I know we're cognizant of your time, Admiral. So we want to make sure that uh, that we uh, respect that. So I have nothing further. So thank you so much for your presentation. Amazing. I think I burned out one of my pins just taking notes and everything. <laughs> <you> said, so. <laughs> oh, thanks. That's kind. And um, again, uh, thanks uh, to you, President Dita, to Lauren, to uh, all the members uh, for the work that you guys do uh, every day. Very complex environment that you all work in. Um, but thanks for uh, your commitment to um, our uh, economic security, our, our defense, and, and our overall national security, um, but doing so in a, in a way that it's both safe and sustainable. Um, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, an honor to uh, serve alongside you all. And if there's anything uh, that uh, your Coast Guard can do for you, please don't hesitate to uh, reach in to us and, and let us know. Thanks so much for the time today and, and good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. And please thank your staff. They're a pleasure to work with. Will do. Thanks, Lauren. Very kind. Um, uh, Rob, you're on mute. Could we go back to questions? Is Tim Orr still with us? Still with us? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Great. I have I have captured the questions. Rob, if you could go on mute because I think when you and I are both on, there's an echo. Uh, first question, Tim, has uh, Tyco looked at hydrogen as a zero emissions option? Uh, absolutely. We, we continue to look at hydrogen not only blended with diesel and the injection cycle uh, to cut emissions down and to, I guess you'd say, uh, not only make it cleaner but cheaper to run, but we're also looking mostly at hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells. Um, hydrogen fuel cells are still very early in this I guess you'd say bumper car industry of terminal tractors, but it, we see that along with batteries as the real end game in most port terminals because it would allow for prolonged usage of the equipment for multiple shifts before you'd need to fuel it um, or plug it in, which uh, especially in the larger ports becomes a real issue when you're working multiple 15,000 plus TEU vessels back to back to back. Uh, nobody can afford to have three times the amount of equipment, so therefore you have to be able to extend the range of that battery system, and more than likely uh, hydrogen fuel cells will be a big part of that. Oh, Lauren, you're, you're muted. You'd think after a year I would learn. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, the writer asks, it's very interesting that you're considering the infrastructure for them, switchable batteries would be the way to go. Any comment on that? Yeah, switchable batteries we looked at in the very beginning, but the complexities that come into lifting large, uh, as you'd say, battery packs in and out of frames. Uh, unlike some equipment, most terminal tractors, the batteries will be put up through the center of the frame, not only as protection from impact, as everybody knows these often get treated as bumper cars, but also anything on the outer side of the frame is subject to damage. Damage could also create other issues of thermal events with, uh, with um, battery systems. So it does make it a more complex system to be able to switch batteries when they're between the frame rails, but it's not outside the realm. It does increase the cost proportionally because the battery pack is a big cost of it's 80 plus thousand dollars just for your standard battery pack right now. That will come down over time, but there's also the issues of what do you do with the batteries once they've reached their maximum, which is about a 70% usage? Uh, what do you do with the batteries then? So all these are questions that we have to answer in the future, but definitely swap outs are a possibility, but we think range extenders uh, uh, both, uh, both uh, um, hydrogen fuel cells, as well as even natural gas or other uh, combustible fuels being used as small generators in the system. Anything that extends that battery usage and allows densification of energy to work multiple shifts is where the port industry is going to have to go because uh, as ships get larger, more complex, and more expensive, sitting at the dock earns no one money. So turning those vessels and 
in the fastest time possible is what we're looking at and what are the stepping stones to get to that full, as we'd say, uh, full authority electric truck that puts out no emissions. And we're a ways from that, but we think between the first question on hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells, and the second one on possible battery swap outs are all possibilities in the future. Um, it just comes down to cost and complexity. Oh, you're on mute again. <laughs> Third time's the charm. I'll try to do it another time. Um, one of my roles is to be an advocate for this industry on the Hill. Do you see a value in getting the phrase near zero emission in legislation alongside zero emission to get Absolutely. some flexibility? Absolutely, because when you really, let's say, distill it down to what it is, um, the electrical grid is powered mostly through fossil fuels right now. So even though you get a zero emissions with a battery powered tractor, you're still getting that electric power from typically coal, natural gas, or, or nuclear, uh, or hydro. But until that changes, you're really not a zero emissions vehicle. As a matter of fact, the studies they did in California on renewable natural gas through landfills and others, uh, with the ultra low NOx engines available now through people like Cummins Westport, you can actually score a lower emissions, carbon emission output with natural gas than you can with a pure electric. And I think, yes, near zero is probably the correct term to use going forward rather than just EV, um, because it does open an opportunity for, I guess you'd say, power beyond the grid itself. And until those things change sometime in the future to wind, uh, nuclear, or other type uh, energy providers, it's still going to be somewhat on the dirty side when you really distill down where the energy comes from. You have no idea how much you just helped me. That's terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have other questions for Mr. Orr? Mr. Orr. Hearing none. Thank you so much for staying. Okay. And Rob, I turn it back over yeah. to you. Privileged. Privileged. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I appreciate your time, Tim, and thanks for all the good information. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to uh, introduce Melissa R Marissa Riley from Origami, uh, and she's going to speak to us about uh, Origami risk, uh, Origami risk as a company, and uh, the services to us. Welcome, Marissa. Nice, nice to uh, see you and meet you right now. <laughs> and uh, and the yeah, the mic is yours. Awesome, thank you. Yes, it's uh, it's great to to meet you and see you. I know we're virtual, but um, I met some of you back in my goodness, I think 2019 now in Montreal, which I loved. That was my first NIMSA that I was a part of um, through Origami. So sad that it's virtual, but still happy to be here. So um, I'm pretty sure that there's a slide deck. I don't know if it's up right now. Um, it is loading. It is loading. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. Um, it takes a few seconds to get back up on the screen. Yeah, not a problem. Um, well, it is really nice to be speaking with you all today. Um, definitely, Origami is grateful for this opportunity to just share a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so today I'll go over, once the slide deck is up, I'm going to go over a little bit about who Origami is. I won't bore you too long going into our full history, but just a little bit about us. Um, and then what my plan was for today is to go over three different stories, um, some of which uh, are, are members here in NIMSA. Um, so three stories of our clients, kind of some problems that they had been facing and just what solutions we were able to offer them. Um, and then if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them today or we'll put my email up there and um, you guys can just email and I can answer any questions through there. So if you want to just navigate over to the next slide for me. OK, perfect. So this is a little bit about who we are, um, if you haven't heard of us. So we've had a relationship with NIMSA for a little over three years now. Um, and I've had the, the honor actually of sitting on the technical committee here for the past year, which has been very insightful. Um, since starting at Origami, um, I actually started three years ago. 
the maritime industry has always interested me. Um, I'm actually actively seeking ways besides just our technology um, to bring value to our relationship with NIMSA and with the technical committee. Um, we were founded in uh, 2009. Uh, we are a leading provider of an integrated software as a service solution for the risk insurance and safety industry. Um, we do deliver a highly configurable uh, full suite of risk management, insurance, and safety core system solutions from a single secure cloud-based uh, platform accessible via any web browser um, and our mobile app. So today we have over 1 million users spanning across um, our 700 plus clients. Um, we conduct a client satisfaction survey each year. Um, it's something that's really important to us is our, is our client satisfaction. And currently we have a 99% customer satisfaction rating, um, which we're really proud of. We're also growing, which is um, fantastic. So we have a little over 400 employees globally um, today. Uh, each technology that you guys see on the screen um, on the right hand side, and then also the technologies I'll be briefly discussing in these stories um, are, excuse me, are core to our clients needs, their platform wide feature functionalities um, that are available to all of our clients. But ultimately what our clients need and what you guys need, you don't need new ideas, but rather you need a flexible technology that supports you, that supports your current ideas and supports your safety initiatives. Um, so we're gonna go over three stories today, um, again, about problems that your peers were facing and then the solution and benefits that Origami was able to provide to them. So if you can navigate to the next slide, please. So the first story is about American Steamship Company. Um, some of the key, uh, key safety features, excuse me, that ASC uses and the ones that we're gonna chat about today are listed on the left-hand side of your screen. What ASC or ASC, excuse me, needed um, was a more efficient way to communicate across their fleet and across their organization. Um, they needed a solution that was gonna be able to consolidate all of their incidents and their near misses into a centralized database and then improve upon the process of sending out corrective actions um, and conducting investigations. So if you'd go to the next slide, please. So to, oh, I think these are a little out of order. Um, that's okay. We'll just go to the dashboard. So um, uh, our client uses uh, Origami to track um, safety and, sorry, to track and complete safety huddles. Um, Origami integrates actually with their HR um, employee database to track whether these employees are on which boats and validate that they attended the meetings. And what you guys are seeing on the screen here and what you saw on the last slide, um, they're actually Origami standard um, and custom reports and dashboards. What they do is they aggregate all of the data elements into easy to read graphs, diagrams, analytics, and reports that you can easily share across your fleet and across your organization. Um, so th those are some examples on the previous screens. And then if you'd go to the next slide. Um, okay, I think so this slide deck's a little outdated. Um, so sorry guys, but um, I'll just speak to, to what a um, ASC uh, does. So to improve upon the collection of incidents and near misses, what they utilize is Origami's powerful incident reporting tool via an anonymous collection portal. So it empowers employees, um, any employee or non-employee to submit an incident directly to the safety team via an online portal that they can access on their web device, on a tablet um, or on their mobile phone. Um, and when an incident is submitted through the portal, an automatic alert and notification is sent directly to the safety managers over at ASC. Um, so the safety team We'll get that email, they'll get that alert, and they'll be able to come in and review the incident right away and determine if additional actions required, whether that be an investigation or assigning out corrective actions. I don't think we have those screens up, um, but I can send screenshots to you guys as well. But if a corrective action or an investigation is needed, it can be assigned through our system to any of their users, to a chief, to a cook, um, to a captain, whoever it might be. And that individual will automatically get an email with a link granting them access into our system to see the corrective action, to review it, and then enter a res resolution as well as any comments that they might have. This client, so ASC, can also assign corrective actions actually to an entire fleet instead of just a specific user. 
So an email can be sent out to all of the captains, all of the chiefs, um, and whoever needs to see that. They'll be able to log in and see not only the other comments of all of the other users that were assigned to this corrective action, but they can enter their own comments in for their specific vessel as well. Um, also, a unique way um, that ASC was able to improve communication, um, and unfortunately this isn't up there, but they have a button up on the um, top of their screen that they can just click on that button right away. And no, not this slide either, that's okay. But they can click on a button automatically to notify the entire fleet of any near misses. They can also share good catches across the organization as well, across the fleet. And this just really helps uh, automate and streamline their communication across all of their vessels and across all of their fleet um, through origami. All right, so if you want to <laughs> go back to the use and terminals case study, um, this is going to be our next story. Um, so technology and risk, um, it's not always fun. Safety, it's not always fun, but um, what's something unique about use and terminals, what they were able to do is kind of put a fun twist on engaging all of their employees to be active and aware of their surroundings. And they were able to create a safer environment and a more alert environment from this. So what they utilize origami for, and I think you had that slide up, is our, is our near miss and near hit reporting. So they use origami along with a, a lot of other features and functionality, um, but by utilizing this near miss reporting in mobile forms, um, they're able to couple this with a fun initiative. So what they do is they encourage and incentivize the field to submit any near miss that they see. Um, and they can give credit through our mobile form. So if you see at the bottom of this form um, where it has name of individual, um, they put the individual that's submitting that near miss. And from that, they're able to give credit to individuals that are submitting data to them. So everyone's very engaged. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think even um, our contact at USEN, their boss walked into the office and, and, and saw a possible near miss and submitted it right away. So um, it really just helps every employee to be active, to be engaged um, and kind of make technology a little bit fun there. Um, and in turn, this obviously enforces a much safer environment for everyone, um, much more, or a lot more people are interactive. And then Origami obviously with their workflow engines can automate any notifications or tasks, any investigations or corrective actions that accompany those um, near misses. And then the team's able to analyze the effectiveness of this safety initiative through our dashboards and reporting. And then if you could go to the case study for MAR terminals, Perfect. OK, so this is our last story for today. Um, it's about MAR terminals. Um, so we talked a lot about near misses, incident reporting, um, but Origami doesn't just offer these tools. Um, I mean, amongst a lot of other tools, we do have a full blown EHMS, so Environmental Health and Safety Suite, that we've recently improved and updated. So um, of the many EHMS functionalities that we have, JSAs were recently added by MAR within Origami. Um, not only did MAR want a faster, more efficient way to conduct JSAs, they also wanted to be sure that they were capturing all of the data that they needed. I'm not sure if this slide got in. Could you try and go to the next slide? Okay, it didn't, but I will send out a screenshot of this JSA. So previously all the JSAs were on paper forms, which really made it hard to know when these were outdated or when they needed to be up for renewal. Um, additionally, when working with major machinery, hunting and tracking down a JSA that's on a paper form is sometimes difficult, which means that there could be major safety elements that are missing. But since MAR moved away from the paper forms are now utilizing origami, it really helps making uh, reporting quicker and easier. And then they also use origami's automatic reminders and tasks um, that are set to notify them when they need to review JSAs or even reevaluate them when needed. So that covers the three stories. I wanted to keep it pretty short for you guys. Um, but if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, um, or I, you guys can email me or give me a call. Um, I'm always here to talk further. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, and 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 the uh, hiccup, hiccups notwithstanding, we we uh, we loved all the information you gave us, and I think. Um, 
we are all, uh, at least we use, uh, we use origami as our uh, risk management and um, risk, man risk management system and uh, really love the functionality of it. So thank you for your help and, uh, and, your, uh, and your presentation. Of course, thank you. OK, uh, next I'd like to uh, hand it over to Jeff Brown. Uh, Jeff has spent his entire career in the industry. Um, he's well regarded for his contributions to the industry through uh, the NIMSA Technical Committee. And um, also he uh, participates in the in the various committees uh, at NAWI. Um, and Jeff is going to introduce our next speaker. I hand it to you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our, our next featured speaker, Rachel Slade. Um, uh, she's a well-respected and award-winning journalist and author who will be talking to us today uh, about her national best-selling book, Into the Raging Sea, uh, 33 Mariners, One Megastorm, and the Sinking of the El Faro. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Ms. Slade's background. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Barnard College, Columbia University, and a Master of Architecture from Penn Design at the University of Pennsylvania. And she was a successful architectural designer until 2005 when her career turned to journalism. And she became a freelance writer with numerous award-winning articles published in the New York Times, Boston Magazine, Esquire, Architectural Digest, and the Boston Globe, among many others. And she eventually became the executive editor of Boston Magazine and continued her notable editing career with the Boston Globe and Down East Magazine. Rachel's now hard at work on her second book, Made in America, detailing the epic saga of bringing back manufacturing to the United States. That's going to be a, a big book. So, on a side note, Rachel is an accomplished gold medal winning, in fact, coxswain. And uh, I'll admit it, I had to look that up to see what that meant. Uh, but for those of you who aren't rowing enthusiasts, a coxswain is the rowing crew member who is responsible for steering the boat and uh, coordinating the power and rhythm of the rowers. Uh, Rachel's book, Into the Raging Sea, is the detailed and compelling story, really compelling story, of the worst American shipping disaster in 35 years, the tragic sinking of the El Faro in October 2015. And I highly recommend it. And I know Lauren does. We talked a little bit beforehand. Uh, we're big fans. But rather than listen to me talk about all this, and without further ado, it's my privilege to welcome and introduce you to Rachel Slade. Rachel? Jeff, thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. And if anybody wants me to steer their boat, I'd be happy to do it. Um, just checking, can everybody hear me OK? Everybody's OK? All right, great. Um, well, first, I wanted to thank Mr. Chairman so much for inviting me to this um, event and the members of the National Maritime Safety Association. Um, wow, have things changed so much since El Faro went down in 2015. So that was seven years ago as of this October and just no pun intended or maybe pun intended sea change here. You know, when I first started reporting about the El Faro, um, very few people, very few lay people, people who were not you, um, didn't really understand the importance of shipping at all. It was a completely invisible industry. Um, I used to say to um, folks when I spoke, um, we think that we are connected by the internet, but in fact, we are also connected by shipping and perhaps even more so. And the global economy would cease to function if shipping uh, were to end tomorrow. And now we have, we have seen exactly what that looks like thanks to the pandemic. Um, we've also seen what that looks like thanks to the ever given um, mainstream media is now talking about shipping all the time, so I don't have to do that work anymore. But I have to say that it was lonely going for a long time. As the Admiral said, our lives are going to get much more complex than today. And 
I'm going to take you back to another time that was also about to revol be revolutionary. Um, I just want to make sure that you can. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, let me make sure I have. OK, here we go. Um, can everyone see this? We're good. Yeah. You, can you see my screen? Oh, OK. I apologize. Yeah, Rachel, um, we see it. It looks good. OK, so you can see, see the slideshow? The we can see yes, it. we see the slideshow. I see the cover of your book. That's it. Just the cover yes. book? OK, great. That's all I see. Um, we're all set. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about the Alfaro. Probably many of you or just all of you um, know that Alfaro was a container ship that went down in 2015 um, off the coast of the Bahamas. We're going to look very carefully at the sequence of events that um, led to the sinking of the ship and the tragic loss of the 33 people aboard. And so I'm going to take you first to the Alfaro. So she started out as the Puerto Rico. She was built in 1974 in Philadelphia, and she was one of several ships just like her. There were six other sister ships that actually some of you may know. Um, on the West Coast. So they were a lot like Tycho was describing a hedge at the time um, because we didn't quite have containerization yet. They were, they were designed in the mid 60s. And we had already built the federal highway um, system. So we had trucks, but we didn't have, um, we didn't have a, we didn't have a na nationwide or certainly not international container system. So the idea of these ships, these roll-on, roll-off ships, was to drive the um, trucks right up onto the ship through these holes, these very large holes in the hull, um, and then park them on the deck and also in the decks below. That's what she was designed for. So this is actually the original announcement of the launch of the Puerto Rico, which then became the Alfaro. So it was Sun Hall number 670. And here she is being launched after being constructed in Philadelphia. I just want to point out, I don't know if you can see um, my, uh, my cursor, but look how narrow she is. So in those days, um, these roll-on, roll-off ships were actually designed for speed and not for efficiency. Uh, she could go up to 24, 25 knots, which is significantly faster than the mega ships go now. And so she had a very narrow hole. That meant that um, while she could go fast, kind of like a barracuda, it also meant that she was tender. So um, as, as uh, mariners say, so it meant that she was sensitive to, um, to, to waves and to wind. And that's something to keep in mind as we move through here. All right, here she is in the water with, um, with the trucks aboard. Those are not containers, those are trucks. And she's loaded with trucks underneath. And I wanna point out, we're gonna look a little in a little more detail at these here, but these are some of the openings. No, wait, this is the port side. She gets lower on the, lower on the starboard side, but um, you can see that there are several openings um, that are fairly close to the water, even though she's, uh, when she's loaded. Looking a little closer at some of these openings, so he here is the top deck, and this is actually an open second deck. And again, what we have here is um, where the ramp would attach to the ship so that you could drive the trucks in. And then we have several exhaust openings. Now these openings are really will become very important for our story. These days, so when these ships were designed, of course, they had to figure out how to ventilate the, um, the, the cargo holds. And these days, what you'll find is uh, generally um, stacks on top of the, um, the deck, right? But um, this was a very revolutionary design. They didn't want to have anything obstructing the decks. And so what they did was they actually ran shafts down the size of the hulls and um, included these large um, uh, fans at the top of the shafts um, to ventilate deep into the holds. Keep this in mind, we're gonna come back to that. And then again, this is um, a drawing of the ship that the, the uh, National Transportation Safety Board did after 
um, during the investigation. And I just wanted to point out that this is the top deck designed for just trailers, not containers, just one layer of trailers. And these are the very large hulls. You've got five, you've got three, you've got two, et cetera. And then I also wanted to point out, look how large these holds are. They were um, separated um, uh, vertically by, um, by, uh, by grills. That meant that they were not watertight vertically. So very, very large volume. And they were not separated horizontally. So these holds went um, from, from port to starboard. So very large holds, very, in theory, very vulnerable. And yet I do wanna point out that her sister ships, the El Faro sister ships were fine, lived a long life and were all retired as of, I believe last year. So um, although they all had these same vulnerabilities, only one actually um, ended up succumbing to weather. The other thing that I'd like to point out, um, just since we're looking at this section of the ship is, here is where you have your, your, um, your life-saving equipment. So these were open lifeboats. They were original in 1974 and were never swapped out. Um, we'll talk about that a little more. This is where the DVR is, the, data, the, the voyage data recorder. Um, this will become very important. So on this deck, this main deck, there were several scuttles. The scuttles were used during the voyage to allow people to go back and forth into the holds to check out whether everything was okay. This, the, and here it is, you can see it on the main deck. It's just a manhole. You can see it's just a few feet, the, the opening is just a few feet off of the deck. This manhole probably was open when the ship left. And it's quite possible that the manhole, the scuttle to hold number three, was never closed. I want you to notice here too that the, the stern and um, the bow are, are, are raised just slightly, which means that whenever waves came over the, the top of the ship, um, this area right here would puddle with water, water would pool here. So if this scuttle were open and the water was high enough, the water could go straight down into the holds and there was literally nothing stopping it. Something to keep in mind. So the ship had major vulnerabilities before anything happened. So again, just to recap and a little bit of new information, built in 1974, so we're talking about 2015 now, the ship is 40 years old. It was um, older than all of us. Um, it was lengthened in the 1980s, 90 feet. In 2003, the spar deck was removed to accommodate containers on the top of the ship, on that top deck. Um, as you know, containers took the world by storm after this uh, ship was built. And so the company that owned it, Tote Maritime, really wanted to adapt it for modern use. So they removed that spar deck and then they started stacking those containers up there. And as we know, the hull was very narrow and was not designed for that load. So you could say she was top heavy if she was loaded three, four, five stacks of containers on her top deck. At some point, we discovered that the plimsoll line was raised three feet, although there's no paper trail as to why that happened or how that approval happened. We've already seen that she was incredibly vulnerable um, and now she was allowed to sit even lower in the water. And again, unclear why. I mentioned this before, but all the original survival gear, including open lifeboats on davits, were grandfathered in. After Tote Maritime in 2003 removed that spar deck, um, it was considered a major modification by the US Coast Guard and they, they, that meant that they should upgrade their survival gear, except that they were petitioned for three years by the company, which said that it would cost half a million dollars to upgrade all that survival gear. And finally, there's a change in administration at the Coast Guard and they allowed the ship to sail with her open lifeboats. Um, she had her original steam engine. So that thing was, was chugging along for 40 years. We're gonna go into the bridge, but I do wanna mention that the officers on the bridge used paper maps 
So when weather information came over the radio or via their sat C terminal, they had to actually plot the weather onto paper maps. They did not have um, digital mapping on that bridge. However, the captain, and we're gonna talk about this, did have access to electronic weather mapping in his stateroom. So he could upload packages from the Bon Voyage system, which was a third party proprietary system. And we will look at that, but the, the other crew and the other officers did not have direct access to that information. So these are all very compelling clues to how something can go so very terribly wrong. All right, so here she is. Uh, I don't know quite when this was taken. I'm gonna say 2013, 2014. You can see that she is sitting fairly low in the water. You can see that we've got four containers stacked at least four high on her deck. She was, again, not designed for that. There were no hull changes um, made when um, the spar deck was removed and she was approved to carry container ships. And we actually don't have the engineer's data um, that, that led to the approval of her carrying the load this way. So here she is sitting pretty low on the water with a very um, heavy deck. Um, those containers are almost up to the navigation bridge. Look at these, look at these big holes in the hole right here. And then it, again, here are the uh, fan boxes to ventilate down below. All right, who was the crew on the final voyage? This is Captain Michael Davidson. He was 53 years old, a graduate of Maine Maritime Academy. Captain Michael Davidson was known as, known as a guy who followed the rules. But there was also a lot of talk about the fact that he rarely left his stateroom during voyages. It seems that he wanted very much to be taken seriously as a mariner, um, but he was not fully engaged with his crew. At the time, there were a lot of trouble, a lot of problems with the crew. As many of you know, especially those who work on the East Coast, um, the, the officers tend to be white and the um, crew tends to be black. Um, there had been some major problems, um, it, uh, including um, the, the murder of a young man um, in 20, of a young black man in 2013. So there were a lot of racial problems in Florida from which is the state from which um, El Faro um, departed. And so we have white officers and a black crew and the, the Tote Maritime was very aware that there were serious communication problems between the two groups. And this was not necessarily the best captain for these kinds of voyages. His um, chief mate was Steve Schultz. Steve Schultz was used to sailing on the West Coast in the Alaskan trade. He had just moved to Florida. So again, he didn't have a really good handle on the politics of these ships um, in, in, the, in the East Coast trade, especially in the Bahamas trade. And he did not understand um, the weather very well either. He was used to um, dealing with the seas in Alaska, which have their own um, <laughs> which, which certainly are stormy and rough. But when you talk about storms and you talk about hurricanes, you're talking about two very different weather phenomena. Our second mate is Danielle Randolph. She was 33 years old at the time. Danielle was also a graduate of Maine Maritime and a Maine native. Danielle had been shipping for 10 years and she really, really loved it, but she was getting exhausted. Um, we talked a little bit about how difficult it has been for mariners during the pandemic being stuck on ships, crews not being changed in a timely fashion. Of course, these, this was before the pandemic, but she was starting to really feel the stress of trying to be a young woman in the 21st century and not being able to be on shore for significant amounts of time. I also want to mention, since we have these two up, that we discovered, um, and it was this was not in the hearings, this was this was not um, exposed in the official reports. But the captain did proposition Danielle um, on the voyage before the, the fatal voyage, and all summer long she was dreading going back onto this ship, um, and she expressed that dread to her friends specifically because she did not want to sail with this captain. 
The third mate was Jeremy Ream, also from Florida. Um, he had come up through the Hawes pipe, as they say, so he did not go to, Ma to Maritime Academy. He was a really smart guy and an autodidact and spent a lot of time, a lot of his downtime, just pulling manuals off of the ship's shelves and teaching himself all kinds of things about weather and how the ship worked and how other systems worked. So he was a tremendous asset. He could have been a tremendous asset during this voyage. And he wasn't afraid to speak his mind. The helmsman included Frank Ham, who was on the first watch with um, the chief mate. We have Jack Jackson, who's originally from Louisiana, New Orleans. Um, he was on the third watch with Jeremy Rehm. And Jackie Jones was on the second watch with Danielle. On the navigation bridge, and this is an actual shot of El Faro's navigation bridge, you can see this is a 40 year old ship. So they had radars, they did not have um, digital mapping. Um, they did not, it's, it's really pretty low tech. Um, as you can see, if you if you go up into ships now, built in 2010 and above, you you wouldn't even recognize this. Um, but this is what they were dealing with—a very old um, workhorse that had been running for almost 40 years straight, and the fuzzy dice. So here's the path that the Alfaro was go was doing back and forth. Um, once once weekly, every day, every week of the year from Jacksonville, Florida to, uh, to Puerto Rico. And you can see on this map that it's a straight shot through some of the deepest parts actually of the Atlantic. There's a there's a um, big canyon here. Um, but I want to bring your attention to the Bahamas. So when we look at the Bahamas uh, from a land perspective, perspective, you can see that they're just wispy little islands, right? There are wispy little islands here and here and here and here, and, and then a larger island here. When we, um, but when we start to look at it from a deep draft perspective, so the Alfaro's draft was 30 feet, you can see that there are actually very few passageways from the east to the west side of the Bahamas. We have the Northeast Providence Pack Channel here. And we have the Crooked Island Passage here. So the El Faro, where she were to take this route, would only have two opportunities to escape a storm coming from the east if she felt squeezed. Let's look at that from the satellite perspective. You can see how shallow all of these areas are. This is essentially a huge landmass. And so this is what the captain was facing on the morning of September 20, of, of October 30th. Sorry, September um, 30th. Okay, so what was happening at that moment? Yeah, this is the Bahamas. This is that chain of islands that I was talking about. Um, this is what the weather forecasters in Miami saw. You, if you've ever seen a, it's, it's called a, a spaghetti forecast. So the, the modelers actually use several different computer um, models. They input the data and they try to predict where a storm is going to, to go. And this is what their models showed. The storm, which at this point was just a tropical storm, could actually shoot straight up the coast. Or it could bend a little bit Go, go west and then up. And some models actually had the storm going straight down into the Bahamas and then shooting up north. So this is what the National Hurricane Center in Miami was looking at before the ship even sailed. And so the question is, when you look at this incredible array of predictions, what do you tell people the storm is gonna do? Well, that's what they do, that's their expertise. So this is their first advisory. You can see the date, Monday, September 28th. They say that there's a tropical depression. So it's not even a hurricane yet. It's called a tropical depression. And this is what would have come aboard the ship. This is what prediction looks like. So you can see it's alphanumerical. The, um, the predictions are in all caps, 
it's actually not very easy to read. Graphic designers would tell you that you should use upper and lowercase to be able to read things better. And in any case, you can see it's all numerical. So you would actually have to plot these points in order to understand what the National Hurricane Center thought was going to happen. And that's exactly what the officers aboard the ship did, but the captain did not. And so I just wanna show you again, I'm gonna point out the date. This is Tuesday, September 29th. This is the day that the ship left port. Um, this is what the National Hurricane Center this is how they digested that information, that spaghetti graph that I showed you. They said, oh, you know, the hurricane's gonna move maybe somewhat toward the Bahamas and then it's gonna shoot up north as all hurricanes do. And this is what the captain saw. Again, September 30th, 2015. This is, in the, this is at 6 a.m. in the morning. The ship was here. The captain had to make a decision. Would the captain choose to go around the long route to avoid any kind of swarm, storm system here, or would he continue on his path straight down to the Atlantic? Now, again, I told you that only the captain had access to this system, the Bon Voyage system, this third party proprietary system. And so this is what he was looking, this beautiful act, uh, graphic interface. And what he could do was actually um, click through today, tomorrow, the next day, and know exactly what time, according to BVS, um, he would arrive in San Juan, Puerto Rico. This system actually was, had a serious lag time on it. It was based on um, uh, the, National, her, the National Weather Service forecast that had been issued six hours prior to him getting this package, to, the, to, to them issuing this package. So I want you to understand that this picture that the captain was looking at at 6 a.m. on September 30th, when he was here trying to make decisions about which route to take, he was actually looking at a package that had digest that had um, consolidated data that was more than 12 hours old. And that's very important because we have a very quickly developing storm. So this, basically this information is garbage and the captain had no awareness of that, um, but you know, we're 50, when, when you're 50 years old and you're looking at this beautiful screen, you think, you think it's real. It seems real. It's just like when we use Google Maps, right? It says, you're going to arrive at 7.04 p.m. at your destination, and it kind of seems like the future. Um, but in fact, this, there, there are a tremendous number of probabilities built into this image, right? First is that the data that the National Hurricane Center was using was correct. The second is that they correctly digested or, or evaluated, analyzed this data. And the third is that the data wouldn't change. So here we have um, the prediction that the storm is going to be somewhere around here. Maybe it would get a little bit closer to the ship's route, but then it would, sh then it would shoot up north. And so the captain felt confident that he could squeeze through here um, and get to Puerto Rico on time. Why did he care so much about getting to Puerto Rico on time? There have been a lot of discussions about the pressure on captains to deal with shipping companies. And anybody who has shipped out, you know that shipping companies, um, uh, the time is money when you are shipping. And there are a whole bunch of people waiting at the other end at San Juan to unload that ship and get you moving. And um, just a few weeks earlier, the captain had also actually taken the cautious route, sim almost identical situation where a tropical storm was coming in and his, his second mate who was not on this voyage convinced him to take the longer route. We don't know what happened to the captain when he chose the longer route that time. The ship obviously was sta safe. That storm never escalated into a hurricane. But we know for sure that on this voyage, this October 1st, 2015 voyage, he was not going to compromise. He was going to take that route and he was convinced that this picture was exactly what was going to happen. And it, even when presented with um, evidence from his officers who were busy plotting information, the freshest information coming in from the National Hurricane Center about the position of the storm and the evolving predictions about the storm's behavior. He refused 
to let go of this picture before you. Just to prove that that's the case, I had this, I, I actually had this phone. So this is the second mate who had convinced the captain, Michael Davidson, to take the safer route uh, three weeks before. His name was Charlie Baird. Charlie Baird had just walked off the ship um, before the start of this voyage and had passed the baton to second mate Danielle Randolph. And the ship was still in, in port in Jacksonville when Charlie Baird texted the captain because he was watching the weather channel in his home in Maine and said, storm forming north of Bahamas. What's your plan? And the captain answered, we're just going to shoot straight down below it. OK. I've been talking a lot about the unpredictability of these storms. You know that all of this is a science, but it is not perfect. And I just would like to point out that the Bon Voyage system predicted that the storm's location far north throughout the entire course of, of the El Faro, far north of where it actually was. So this is where um, the Bon Voyage system predicted that the storm was, the eye of the storm, this is the eye. This is where the National Hurricane System uh, uh, Center thought that the eye of the storm was during this voyage. And this is the actual path of the storm, later confirmed. They were all wrong. This is the last known location of El Faro. We are looking at the wind speeds during the voyage, September 30th, throughout the day, October 1st. You can see that um, at midnight on October 1st, or when the date changed, um, the winds were still calm. And then they reached astronomical levels. Look at this, 110 knots. So as the ship moved closer and closer into the storm and started to enter the eye wall of the storm, which is the, the, the most dangerous part of the storm, she was experiencing incredible winds. And here's the damage that we could see now after Hurricane Joaquin on the Bahamas. This is the kind of damage that you get from winds at those speeds. Look at that. Um, we actually had a container ship that, that found itself thrown a mile in to one of the islands of, on the, during the storm. So these winds are not um, minor winds, they're, they're major. And here's here. This gives you a sense of um, how big that hurricane was. This is the state of Florida. I hope you can see that. This is the Gulf of Mexico. This was this was a very strong, um, but contained storm. And the accident happened right here, just north of the eye. Okay, going back to the El Faro's vulnerabilities, just wanted to remind you again, here is that scuttle over the num number three hold. Um, there's some other things I'd like to point out to you. This is where the lube oil is. So as you know, um, these are huge engines that run these propellers and um, uh, they take a thousand, I, I, let me make sure I get this right. Please excuse me if I've got this wrong. I think it's a thousand gallons of oil running through um, the machinery. And all that oil then, it's, it's a closed system and it, it collects right here at the bottom of the ship in a sump. And then gets pumped back up and runs through the, through the machinery again. I also would like to point out this location here. So by the way, this is the water line. This location here, now we're, several, we're about 15, 20 feet below the water line is where the emergency fire pump is. The emergency fire pump, oh, sorry, um, I don't know if I can go back, um, but the emergency fire pump is um, draws water. So it, it actually, um, it, it's, a, it's a pipe that connects, that breaks through the hull of the ship 15 feet down and um, can draw water into a closed fire suppression system that then can be pumped throughout the ship. 
we'll get back to that in a second. For your purposes, since, since a lot of you um, represent longshoremen's organizations, it's important to know that the cars in three hold and throughout the ship were not properly secured according to the ship's um, cargo securing manual. So you'll see here that um, they, there's, there's this chain that ties it, that ties the car's wheels to a single chain. So you've got four cars, maybe five cars here. And by the way, this was not the Alfaro, this was the sister ship, but um, the, the US Coast Guard actually went to the sister ship to see how the longshoremen um, were securing cars on similar ships. That's not how it's supposed to be done. This is actually from the cargo securing manual. Um, the cars are supposed to be actually secured to the to the little buttons that are that are um, welded onto the deck of the ship. The problem here, of course, that is that there could be in tough weather a tremendous amount of movement in that chain. You can never get that chain tight enough to keep these cars down. And when you start having movement, you start having problems. And on that deck, so that's that was the bottom deck in cargo in cargo hold three, was that fire suppression pump that I was telling you about. So now we're 15 or 20 feet down below the water line. It's a very simple pump, and um, it is connected to. There's an eight-inch pipe that cuts right through that hull and feeds um, this series of pipes that then um, can pump the water all over the ship. You can see that there are pipe protection or pump protection pipes here on this. This is the sister ship El Yanke. And I'm not sure, I have spoken to a lot of people who knew El Faro well. I'm not sure that these um, protection pipes were actually in place on El Faro. That meant that this thing was extremely vulnerable. That meant that if a car broke loose during the voyage, it could bang right into that pipe and breach it. And then you would have free communication with the sea 20 feet below the waterline. As, as you probably know, the, 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 closer, the deeper you get, um, the further down below the waterline, the more pressure there is on um, you know, coming from, from the water. And so if a car did break this connection, then this would be more powerful than a fire hose, more powerful than, um, than, than a, a fire plug, a breached fire plug. Um, the ship would start taking on water like, like nobody's business. After we lost El Faro, um, there were a lot of studies done. So let's look at what they found. If you had um, if you had wind heel, for example, so if you had a very strong wind, which the El Faro did, coming on the port side, it could push. It did, in fact, push um, the ship significantly over to the starboard side. So that's just wind heel. That's just the force of the wind pushing on these stacked containers, pushing the El Faro over. And you can see immediately why I was bringing up those. Um, those ventilation shafts, because as soon as she dipped over far enough, she would start taking on water here, right here in those fan boxes, free communication with the sea. If that cargo hold was, if, sorry, if that scuttle was open, remember I showed you that scuttle on the, on the deck of the ship was open, and if water was coming in and pooling and coming down, then you already have the ship sitting lower in the sea. So that give, makes her even more vulnerable to wind heel um, and, and the possibility that she's scooping up water through these um, ventilation openings. And um, here, here you can see that again, she's rolling because she's in tremendous wind and tremendous waves as she's entering the eye or the, the, the eye wall of the storm and, um, and she just starts taking on water. But nobody really understood that she was taking on water not until the very end. I also wanted to talk a little bit about another vulnerability. Remember I mentioned that oil pump, the, uh, the, the sump pan? So unfortunately the sump pan, which was in the bottom of the ship here, you can see this is from the original drawings. The, um, the, the, uh, the bell, the, the mouth of the bell, um, the bell mouth of the pipe that drew the oil 
to feed the the motors and the engines and um, equipment was actually off center. So it was over to um, the starboard side, which meant that when the oil, when the ship started to move back and forth, occasionally that mouth could come out of the oil. And in fact, that's just what happened. Now, if the oil had been actually at regulation level, it would have been up here and there would have been no chance that that could happen. But Tope Maritime encouraged its engineers to um, sail with lower oil levels. It was probably cheaper and easier not to continually top off. So they actually sailed with pretty low oil levels, which meant that as the ship started to approach the storm and get deeper into um, the, the tremendous winds and, and the high waves, and she started rocking back and forth, the, en the chief en engineer at four in the morning noticed that he was losing oil pressure. So he called up to the captain, who finally, by the way, appeared on the bridge of the ship. He was gone from eight at night to four in the morning. He called up and he said, I'm concerned about my oil pressure. I'm concerned about this list. And the captain said, what list? The captain was not aware that they were listing, was not aware that how tremendously they were listing and how vulnerable he was. So I've shown you a bunch of, bunch of diagrams that show precisely how vulnerable they are. You and I know this, but the captain did not know his own ship. He did not understand his own vulnerabilities. So he had no idea that if, if you are listing 15 degrees or 18 degrees, not only was, were you risk, risking losing oil pressure, but you could also scoop up seawater. I'm now gonna play you, if I can, let's see if this works. The emergency phone call from Captain Davidson to shore at seven in the morning after he finally lost his propulsion. Now, just a minute, just a brief um, expl explanation about that. The lube oil was problematic. The, sh the ship's captain, Michael Davidson, assumed that it had something to do with wind heel. He knew that they were, they were listing. And so what he wanted to do was right the ship. So he turned the ship by hand. He took the ship now off of um, the autopilot and turned the ship into the wind. And the idea was that the ship, that the wind would come straight, with the wind coming straight in, they would no longer have wind heel. And then his chief engineer could figure out what was going on with the lube oil. Well, what happened was, that ship ended up getting clipped then on the starboard side. So they had been, the wind had been pushing them on the port side, had been pushing them over to starboard. When he turned the ship into the wind, eventually the wind clipped them on the starboard side, just throwing them over to the port. You can imagine how dramatic that was. She's a loaded ship. She's now sitting pretty low to the water. She's already taking on water because of that open scuttle. So she's sitting even lower into the water and her cars are not secured. They weren't secured properly. So when the ship gets thrown over to the port side, the, um, the, the, the lube oil is completely lost and propulsion goes dead. And in a, in a, in a steamship, when you lose propulsion like that, when, when, you, um, when, when you lose your, your oil like that, the whole system freezes and it becomes very difficult to get it started again, especially when you were approaching the eye of what at that point was a category four hurricane. So let me see if I can play this for you. And please let me know if you can't hear it. This is the emergency call from ship to shore. Um, I, think, I think you can't hear it. I'm sorry. Well, if you want to hear it, email me and I'll, I'll send a, a clip to you. But in any case, um, the captain reaches out to shore. He gets the equivalent of a 911 call operator. He says, I have a marine emergency and would like to speak to a QI. That's a qualified individual. We have a hull breach. He said, a scuttle blew open during the storm. I'm not sure if that's the case. Nobody is convinced that it actually blew open. It's probably due to negligence. We have water down in three hole. That is certainly true. We have a heavy list. We've lost the main propulsion unit. The engineers cannot get it going. Can I speak to QI, please? The captain was begging to speak to Tope Maritime's safety engineer ashore. 
he had left a message for the safety engineer um, about 10 minutes before and hadn't heard back. There was no backup system for in at Tote Maritime for who should be the, the contact, the, the point person um, during an emergency if the primary contact could not be reached. And in this case, the primary contact could not be reached. So the captain had to call the equivalent 911. I'm sorry that you can't hear the call because it is upsetting. Um, we are now only 20 minutes away from losing the ship. The captain is clearly trying to stay calm, but it's a very urgent call. The ship vanished and the Coast Guard had no understanding of all that I just showed you. And so when the ship lost communication with shore, for the first 24 hours, the Coast Guard thought that they were just trying to regain communication. And so they did not send out a search party and they couldn't have anyway, because where the ship fell off um, the map essentially um, was uh, the eye of the storm. And that storm sat there. That storm was one of these um, new storms that we're going to be seeing a lot more of, which is very, very slow moving. Uh, Hurricane Joaquin um, escalated quite quickly, but only moved at about four knots, which meant that it just sat there churning the water day after day after El Faro lost communication. And I just wanted to mention why that is the case. Um, you'll be hearing more and more of this um, as we, you know, as we start to acknowledge climate change. But as you know, the oceans are getting warmer. And um, that means that the, the depth of the warmth is increasing. So it used to be that, uh, and hurricanes feed off of hot water, right? So what hurricanes do is they, they kick up and, and they churn up the water. And when they churn up the water where they are, they're churning up the lower layers. So the, the heat then gets pulled under and the cooler waters move up. And that's what propels, that's part of what propels um, a hurricane forward. The problem here, the problem now, the problem with the 21st century is that we have increasing depth of hot water, which means that that water can churn and churn and churn and not significantly change the temperature of the atmosphere um, uh, where, where that hurricane is. So hurricanes are moving a lot slower. That's a problem for shipping, but that's also a problem on land. That's why we're getting a very significant flooding um, in Alabama, South Carolina, on the Gulf, Gulf Coast, because hurricanes are sitting. They're not moving the way they used to. So they're sitting and they're dumping water. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's um, the significance of the storm, but it's also the time that it gets to sit there that causes so much damage. The ship disappeared. After 24 hours, the hurricane moved on slightly and the, um, the Coast Guard was able to send in uh, just a couple of assets. Um, they sent one cutter in there but couldn't get anywhere near the point of last communication with the ship. And they were able to send in a plane, not a helicopter, a plane, just to surveil the area to see if they could see a ship. So again, they thought they were looking for a ship Maybe the ship was disabled, maybe the ship has nearly lost communication, but they were looking for a ship. And after eight hours of um, flying in that horrendous weather, coming through the, 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 eye, the, the eye wall, experiencing instantaneous 700 foot drops, then coming back up, um, the, US Co the, the pilots of, of these planes for the US Coast Guard determined that there was no ship in the area. Eventually, after a week of searching, they began to find debris in the ocean. They found an oil slick. They began to find evidence that a ship was gone, that an American ship was gone. But they couldn't find it. It took three missions to locate this ship or to locate the, the voyage, data voyage data recorder. So the first mission was just to find the ship. El Faro had um, sunk in 15,000 feet of water. 
And I emphasize that because the Titanic sunk in 12,000 feet of water. So this is deeper than the Titanic. This is uh, over a half mile deeper than the Titanic. So you can imagine the incredible pressure down there where she sank. And um, so, of course, the, the, it was impossible to send a manned operation down there. Um, but first, they had to find this ship. And they, the Coast Guard had an enormous um, area um, to, to search for a ship at the bottom of the sea. So they used sonar. And they dragged this sonar um, device along the ocean floor, looking for anomalies in the ocean floor that would indicate the hull of a ship. And finally, after two weeks of dragging this sonar back and forth very slowly across the ocean floor, they found this. Is that, is that not eerie? Look at the, um, it, looks, it looks like it's splashed, right? Like this is the ocean floor. And, and this shows you the impact, what the impact must have been like when that ship finally landed on the ocean floor. Just incredible. After they located the ship, they sent down another um, unmanned vehicle that they could control. And they started getting eerie photographs of what that ship looked like. What we're looking at right now is um, one floor below the navigation bridge. So the navigation bridge had actually torn off the top of the ship. And I, I don't know if I pointed out, but the voyage data recorder was actually atop the navigation bridge. And that's really what they wanted to, to find. The voyage data recorder they hoped could give us all kinds of information about what happened during this voyage, but it was gone. Here she is, this is a computer rendering of El Faro on the ocean floor. You can see that um, all of her lines float down there, which again makes it really, really difficult to run these unmanned vessels because um, they are tethered to, to, the, uh, to the boat from which they are operating. And so you always run the risk of getting them caught, tangled in these um, lines. So you can see the thing is twisted. Um, the containers are crushed and twisted. They believe that it took four and a half minutes for El Faro to reach the bottom of the ocean floor. And as she did, she probably um, spiraled. And as she spiraled, all of the containers that you saw on her deck fell. So there was an enormous debris field um, as she fell. Uh, there was enormous debris field around the accident site. Again, just, uh, the, so, so this is actually the navigation bridge. It was half a mile from the hull of the ship. They finally found it on the second reconnaissance mission. Um, and this is where the voyage data recorder should have been, but it was gone. Okay, this is the debris field. This is the hull. You can see there were all kinds of things littered on the ocean floor. So trying to get a voyage data recorder in this mess was really, really hard because they had to send down extremely expensive equipment um, that had you know, bright lights on it and a camera, and it was tethered by a million dollars worth of fiber optic cable um, to, to um, the, the boat um, that, from which the National Transportation Safety Board men were um, operating the thing. But, they had, but when they were down there, they had to navigate around all of these hazards. And each hazard um, presented an opportunity if they ran into it, or if they got tangled in anything like that, um, then they would lose their equipment. So it was very slow going trying to find this voyage data recorder. And um, you can see here, uh, these are, I believe these are meters. So 4,700 meters were very, very deep. Um, this is where that bridge was. This is where the voyage data should have been. This is where the voyage data recorder was actually found. So halfway between the hull and the bridge. 
It was found on the second reconnaissance mission. So this took four full weeks to locate on the ocean floor. This is what they were looking for. It's about the size of a coffee can. And inside, or I should say, you can see that it's, um, it's attached here with two clips. So you just lift the clips and um, then you could free this thing. Now, um, Voyage data recorders are actually mounted in what's called a float free configuration. So when they hit water, if they hit water, God forbid they do, um, it actually can float free. So you don't have to go 15,000 feet down to capture it. But as you can see, this is an older configuration mounted to this deck. And so finally in August, not, uh, nine months after Alfaro vanished, um, they sent a robot down that was again controlled from a ship, uh, from a boat 15,000 feet above um, to retrieve this coffee can on the ocean floor. And this is actually what it looked like. So you can see it has um, pincers that first had to lift those clips off and then grab the thing, put it into a steel basket and then bring the basket very slowly back up to the surface of the water. Really incredible operation. And all told, finding that ship and retrieving this um, voyage data recorder cost all of us taxpayers $3 million. OK. What was on that voyage? What was inside that? So you unscrew that coffee can, and inside is another cylinder. You can see it's. Uh, uh, milled steel and inside of that is a tiny little graham cracker sized um, motherboard with a couple chips on it. They had no idea what was on this. The The Voyage data recorder actually um, uh, was very old and they weren't sure whether anything had been recorded on it. And so this young man um, who works from the National Transportation Safety Board, it's his job to listen to um, black boxes. This is the ship's black box. This is his job. This is what he does for a living. And you can imagine what that's like. And so the first thing that he did was, well, was there anything on it? And what he discovered was that there was 26 hours of recording on this ship. Then he needed to know, do we have the right voyage recorded? 26 hours. It could have started recording and stopped recording at any point during this voyage data recorder's life um, because it had never really been serviced. So he goes all the way to the end of the recording. And what does he hear? He hears chaos. He knows he's got the right thing. So they immediately pull together a panel of experts, um, mariners, um, the US Coast Guard, National Transportation Safety Board people. And they sat in this room. This is the very room in Washington DC where they sat and they all put on headphones and they went through that 26 hours to tr transcribe um, the voices that they heard on this recording to try to piece together what happened during that voyage. So this is the room. I was there, this is my water, these are my notes. <laughs> Um, just incredible. And so what we have now is a 500 page transcript that explains all the decision, well, that captures all the decision making aboard that ship over those fateful 36 hours. Really incredible. And that is a very technical description of what happened, um, how we Americans, lost a container ship in 2015. Thank you very much. And um, I really look forward to your questions and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to such an esteemed group of folks. Thanks, Rachel. That, uh, it's an amazing story. Um, we do have a, if you want to go back and try to share that, uh, transmission from the captain. Uh, according to my friend Jennifer Jennings, you can share videos on Teams with audio when selecting the presenting mode. 
you have to click or enable include system audio. So. Oh, oh boy, well, that, that sounds really complicated. You know, I appreciate your offer. I just, you can see I'm wearing headphones because for some reason my computer won't even play. Um, so I'm, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to do that. But I can give it to you and um, people who are listening in, you know, you can put it up on your um, private uh, uh, internet. Yeah, that'd be great. Can you talk a little bit about how you research this story? Yeah, I would love to. Let me um, take this off. So am I am I sharing anymore? No, nope, it's just you. Oh, okay, great, it's just us. Okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, as, as Jeff gave you a little bit of my bio, I am not a mariner. I didn't know anything about maritime. And when I first heard about the loss of El Faro, I was like, what the heck is this? Like, how could we lose a ship in 2015? It just seemed absolutely impossible. And then my second thought was, I don't know anything about the shipping industry. So, um, you know, the first thing that I did was go to the library, which is what I have a tendency to do. Um, I love history. And I said to the Boston Public Library, which is a fairly large library system, I said, what do we know about shipping? And the Boston Public Library said, we know this much. This, this is about how many books on shipping were in the Boston Public Library system. It wasn't a lot. It isn't a lot. People weren't talking about shipping. We certainly are now. And that's why I introduced, when I, when I introduced myself, I said, things have really changed. But at the <clears> time, there wasn't a lot of information. So I read everything that I could. Um, then I started going to those um, hearings. There were three hearings, six months apart, um, two weeks each. And I started meeting people who are involved in the maritime community. And my best source of all, I have to say, was um, the former chief mate of El Faro um, and El Yonke, who had been fired in 2012. He knew Captain Davidson a little bit. And he knew that ship like the back of his hand, and he was angry, and he was a terrific source. He really helped me understand the Mariner's language and how Mariners think. And when that transcript came out, I flew down to Fort Lauderdale to hang out with him and go through that transcript line by line. I also um, was able to take a ship, a container ship, across the Atlantic. Um, I, I started in Rome, just north of Rome. And it was an Italian container ship, not an American container ship. Um, and so it was 12 days at sea, which was fantastic. Uh, and I was also able to do a few um, piloting expeditions with the very pilot who took El Faro out for her last run. So I flew down to Jacksonville and Eric Bryson was kind enough to take me on some ships and uh, I, I boarded one via, you know, late at night via that ladder. Um, it's really scary. I'm surprised I'm still alive. Um, but yeah, I climbed up all, the whole of the ship and um, went all the way up to the navigation bridge and took it into Jacksonville and then did that a couple more times with other ships. So it was just just amazing that that he he got me, he, he took me on those voyages. So yeah, a lot of a lot of um, firsthand experience, and I have to say that um, some of the book was written on the navigation bridge of that Italian ship at sea. So you know, while I was reading the transcript and thinking about what it was like on the Alfaro in that storm, I could just look up, and I was on a ship. I could watch um, the captain and and his officers and um, and the other people aboard the ship interact. So it was just really a tremendous opportunity to kind of bring this stuff to life for somebody who before this had no understanding of maritime. Uh, great job with that. And uh, I have a question here. Uh, did any crew members ever complain that the ship was not actually designed to stack containers on deck? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So, you know, that pretty much leads to the second half of my talk that you're not going to hear today, which is about who says what, right? And that's, I'm sure, a lot of what you do all day long is manage, um, manage these things. Like, you know, you have a chain of command, you have a very strong hierarchy, 
Um, you have a shipping company that doesn't want to know if things are going wrong. They certainly want to deal with it internally. If they are, they they just shipping companies just hate when you report things to the Coast Guard. And I hope I'm not offending anybody right now. It's just I'm just telling you what I've heard. Um, so don't shoot the messenger. But there's a tremendous reluctance, right? People will speak among themselves. And when we read the transcript and when, when we bring it to life, um, you know, people will absolutely speak among themselves. They'll say, this isn't safe. That's not safe. We shouldn't be doing it this way. That's not how you tie down cars. But will it get to the captain? Will it get to the Coast Guard? Will it get to the shipping company? Unlikely. So many things end right there. So many conversations, so many safety concerns end right there at, at the at the point where the person see it and says nothing, sees it and says nothing. So I, I think I think the other thing to keep in mind is that when you have an old ship and you have a company that's that's dysfunctional, people are trained just to do things and they don't understand why. So there was a time, of course, when that secure cargo securing manual, for example, was discussed and you know people went through it and perhaps even talked about the why why do you tie down a car this way versus that way but over time you know when we start cutting corners we um just to say do it like that do it like that and we get no explanation as to um why it might be you know thinking thinking why why maybe we don't um you know, accept an 18 inch list. I'm sorry, an 18 degree hit list. Like what are the vulnerabilities of the ship? We're just go, go, go all the time. And so we follow um, instructions and we follow protocol and we don't give human beings or fellow human beings permission to think. And that is the problem as we, we further automate, right? We're depending on machines to tell us what to do. And as we um, hurry, as we rush, and I know that the ports are busier than ever now, and there's a tremendous amount of pressure to, uh, to, to move things quickly. And uh, it, it worries me, and I'm sure it worries you, that things are being seen, but things aren't being said. So we need that uh, origami uh, near miss, good catch technology and, and really use it. Um, are there any heroes from this tale? Yeah. So the interesting thing is, remember when I was telling you that the officers and ship's officers had to plot the data while the captain was just looking at that interface, the Bon Voyage interface that was woefully outdated? Using your hands. Now, here I am speaking as, as a person who's now, you know, lived quite a few decades. <laughs> Doing things by hand has a way to connect the brain to the stuff that's happening all around you. And sometimes just looking at a picture uh, doesn't quite have the same immediacy. She, second mate Danielle and third mate Jeremy Reen both saw exactly what was happening. They could see the, the, the National Weather Service forecast shifting. They could see the location of the, of the hurricane shifting and the predictions um, shifting because every time they plotted it, they, they could actually, you know, feel with their hands how, oh man, you know, this thing is actually shooting a lot further south and a lot further west than it first said, than, than, than had first been predicted. And so actually um, at midnight when Jeremy Ream was leaving the navigation bridge, so this is now seven hours before Alfaro disappeared under the waves. He said to Danielle, he said, there's a way out. He said, I've plotted it again. We're clearly going straight into the eye of the hurricane as, as, I've, as I've seen it. And if we just take this channel, and let me, let me see if I can um, just remind you of uh, those channels. Um, I'm gonna show you that map one more time, if you don't mind. No, no, please. Okay. So, Look at me being on Microsoft's team. <laughs> um, okay, am I sharing it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you can see um, there was a channel here. So when they were right about here 
at midnight, Danielle was able to plot a course that would take them through these islands and through these, this channel to safety. So Puerto Rico is, is over here, of course. So she actually charted that course and she took 45 minutes to, or sorry, to, she took an hour to plot this course. And she finally turned to her helmsman and said, I think I figured out a way out. Then she waited another 45 minutes. So as she's waiting, of course, they're, they're, they're steaming closer and closer to the hurricane. So things are getting pretty bad. She waited another 45 minutes before finally calling the captain and saying, I think I have a plan. She calls the captain. She clearly and professionally lays out her plan. She says, if we sail through this channel, then we can get away from this storm. The captain, we know, does not download the most recent weather information, does not come up to the bridge, and does not consider what she's telling him, and instead says, run the other course, which then steers them further east, thereby securing their fate. So this so, is what you were able to gather from the transcripts? from the Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is why the transcripts were so incredibly important. We know that first Charlie Baird, that second mate who was in Maine, he, he, gave, the, he gave the captain the first warning. The second warning came from uh, Chief Mate Steve Schultz when they were up at that deciding moment, right, when to, to take the safe way or, or to take the direct way. Um, Steve Schultz said, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. And the captain made fun of him for being over cautious, overly cautious. The third warning came right before midnight when Jeremy Ream called down to the captain and said, we're steering straight into the hurricane as I see it. And the captain said, BVS tells me we'll be fine. We're gonna shoot right below that storm. And then finally that, that, that final warning came from Danielle when she said, I'm, I'm on the navigation bridge. I'm looking at the weather, the latest weather and I have found a way out and he completely ignored her. Wow, wow. I know we kind of went long, but thank you so much for, oh, for, thank you. for your research. It's, I, again, I really recommend the book. I, I just do it. And Rachel, I just can't let this opportunity pass. You had to be so motivated to write the book. And I think I heard you say earlier that you spent three years and you went through things and you traveled and you experienced what it's like to be in shipping. Um, what, what would you say to someone today about a career in shipping? Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, this was a once in a generation or almost two generations event. And I think Alfaro is on everybody's minds around the world. Anybody who gets anywhere in your ship now knows about Alfaro. And I have met a lot of really wonderful young um, cadets and maritime students, uh, maritime academy students, and they are smart. And, um, you know, they know this story. And I always say to them, speak up, stay safe. I think that, um, I think, I, I, I mean, it's a necessary profession, right? We, we absolutely need it. And, but I, I think, you know, the maritime profession onshore and on ships um, is so much like so many of our industries where the people who are actually doing the work oftentimes have very little say over their fate. And um, they are our most important assets. So um, if you are thinking of going into the maritime industry, although I assume everybody here is pretty much in the maritime industry, um, I would say um, if you see something, say something, and if you are uncomfortable, get the hell out. Well said. Thank you. Um, the accolades are going in the chat box. We're hearing an excellent presentation. That was so amazing. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Great information. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. You know, I I read the book and and you know your your presentation here, you know, revealed just enough to where you know you, you just feel what went on. But when you read that book, it is heart wrenching. It really is. It's a tearjerker. So, um, a big fan of Danielle. I always say that I I felt that she was the heroine thing for sure, and really really great. 
Um, and thank you so much for spending the time to to talk to us about it. It must have been such a such a labor of love, and 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 probably doubly as heartbreaking to you to go through everything. So, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we had some great speakers today. I, I, again, Rachel, amazing, and and the and the Coast Guard Admiral John uh, John Mauger. Um, we thank them for for being here and and uh, and speaking to us today. Um, Okay, so tomorrow we start again tomorrow at uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 12 noon and 1 p.m. Eastern uh, for more speakers. Um, I want to thank uh, Tyco Terminal Investment Corp for uh, for present or for uh, sponsoring us. Uh, Origami, thank you, thank you for your support and uh, your sponsoring us, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I also want to mention other other sponsors uh, for our uh, event, DuPont Sustainable Solutions, uh, the Pacific Maritime Association, Starcrest Consulting Group, and USMX uh, are all sponsoring our, uh, our organization through this event. Uh, thank you for your years of support and service uh, to, to, our, uh, to our industry and to safety. Um, Without your, without their support, we uh, we cannot uh, we cannot meet our mission goals. So, Rob, there's nothing Rob, further. Go ahead, Lauren. Do you have anything? Some sorry, housekeeping? I, yeah, just uh, just one correction. Uh, we start at 11 a.m. Pacific tomorrow, and it's 2 p.m. Eastern. Okay, my notes are wrong. So, all right, 11 a.m. Same as today. Okay. Same as today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We appreciate your uh, your participation. I hope you uh, I hope you learned a lot uh, a lot from this present from these presentations. Great job. Thanks, Rob. Great job. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Meeting for today. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Very See you tomorrow.